How's it going? My name's Dim, and in this episode, I'll be taking our file storage web app, BigBox, and expanding the tech stack to utilize Firebase for user authentication. With this, we'll give users the ability to view and manage their uploaded files. Expanding on our very professional diagram here, we can see that our website will now connect to Firebase for logging in and out. Our upload process and any other future interaction with the API will contain Firebase credentials that our server will validate the request with. This is not going to be the easiest and going to require quite a bit of referencing the Firebase documentation, but as long as you follow along and code with me, you should have a rudimentary understanding of Firebase and third-party authentication services. With all that said, let's jump right into it. For starters, you're going to want to head over to the Firebase console and create a project. I'm going to name the project BigBox and link it to my existing analytics account. We aren't going to use Google Analytics, but this is a required step. Once that's done, we're going to click on the Add to Web Project button from the Project Overview screen and enter some information about our web app. Since we don't have a build process and are just using plain old HTML, we're going to select the Use a Script Tag button and copy the co that code to our HTML file. Like I mentioned before, we are not going to use Google Analytics for Firebase, so we can get rid of that import. However, we are going to use Firebase auth, so let's change the analytics part of the import URL to auth and import some of the functions we need from it. Scrolling down, we change the analytics and get analytics to auth and get auth, respectively. Now, let's go over to our Firebase project and configure Firebase auth. Let's click the Get Started button and select some authentication methods. For this project, I want Anonymous Authentication and Google Authentication. You may add more forms of authentication if you'd like, but to keep it simple, I'll just stick with these two. The reason I want to use anonymous authentication is so that users who have not signed in with Google can still upload files. Later, we are going to add a feature so that when a user visits the website without signing in yet and uploads a file, when that same user signs in, the files they uploaded while anonymous will be owned by their signed in profile. Now, heading back over to our code, Let's import a couple more functions from Firebase Auth. The functions we'll be needing are sign in anonymously, sign in with pop-up, and the Google Auth provider class. By default, Firebase Auth state persists in local storage, so we don't have to configure that. We are also going to be using a function that is a member of the Auth class called auth.onAuthStateChanged, which calls the callback function every time the Auth state changes, such as when a user is authorizing anonymously, signs in with a provider, or signs out. This function is great because it lets us catch all those events in one function. Now, I decide to test out the on auth state changed method by calling sign in anonymously. I get an error because I forgot to pass in the auth instance. After passing that in, we can now see that our console contains user info. Expanding that, we can see that the is anonymous field is true since we signed in anonymously. This field will be useful for later. There is also a field called access token, which is a long string that we'll be sending to the server to authorize requests. If you want more information about what this string is and the data it contains, this string is called a JSON web token, and you can use this debugging tool to find out exactly what the data the token contains. The reason why JSON web tokens are so amazing is that they are cryptographically signed and can be verified to prevent any data tampering. This means a user cannot modify the ID within the access token to impersonate another user and get control over their account. With that out of the way, let's allow users to sign in using Google. We'll add a sign in button with the ID sign in so that we can easily reference the element from our JavaScript code. We can look up the element using get element by ID or query selector. Here I just use query selector with the hash symbol before sign in. We can set the on click property to control what happens when the user clicks the element. Here I'm using an arrow function because they just look nicer than regular functions to me. To use Firebase to sign in with Google, we must first instantiate our Google Auth Provider class. After doing that, we call the auth.signinwithprovider method and pass in the provider we instantiated. For consistency with the rest of the code, I change this to use the classless method, sign in with provider, and pass in the auth instance. Anyway, my challenge here for you is to implement other providers so that sign in by Google isn't the only option. Back to our app, we can now see that when we sign in with Google, our user is logged in the console containing my Google email address and Google display name. We have a user ID at the bottom which is unique to us and we'll later be using to store information in the database for lookups.
Once again, heading over to our JWT debugger, we can see exactly what information the JWT token contains. Now, let's modify our code a bit so that whenever a user is not authenticated at all, we sign them in anonymously. This can be done by checking if auth.currentUser is null, which I discovered through a bit of messing around in the JavaScript console. Testing that out, that seems to be in order. Our auth state starts as null and then becomes an anonymous user. Amazing. Here, I move the sign in anonymously call to the callback function. Now that that's all done, let's introduce two new fields into our file struct, the user ID and created at. I'm just adding created at because it's useful information to have for later when we're sorting our files. The user ID is very important because it tells us what user uploaded what file. We can use that information later to verify whether a file belongs to a particular user or not. Something I'm doing here for faster lookups is creating an index on user ID. The ORM that we're using does not seem to provide a native method of doing this, so I'm just writing a raw SQL statement. What this is doing is creating indices pointing directly to the rows where the user ID is a certain value. If we don't create an index and query the rows looking for a particular user ID, Postgres would have to go through each individual row and make that comparison. If we create an index, our user ID will get looked up in a hash table that contains references to each row with that user ID. On a small scale, the performance boost is negligible, but when your table starts to have millions of records, you'll be saving several seconds on queries. Also, don't forget to throw in an if not exists in there to avoid errors. Rerunning our app, we get an error that user ID does not exist. Well, that's because we are creating the table only if it doesn't exist. We still have that old table in our database with the old columns. This means that the new columns we added to our struct aren't in the database. The simplest way of getting around this is just adding a drop table to our code. You'll see me making user ID not null. I'll come back to that a bit later. Anyway, after running the drop table line, I commented out so we don't have to drop the table every time the app is started. Now we seem to be good. Let's try uploading a file. And well, we end up getting an error because we made our user ID field not null, and we didn't set user ID when inserting into the database. In order to get the user's ID, we must first send it from our client. Here we're going to add a hidden form field called token. We want to send the server our access token, but it's not something the user enters. This is why we use a hidden form field. Let's give it an ID of token as well so it's easy to reference. Heading over to our callback function in on auth state changed, let's update the value of that field whenever there is a user access token. Now let's go to the server code and decode that access token. To do that, we will have to install Firebase admin on our server. Firebase admin lets you use Firebase on the backend. We want this to be able to decode and verify JSON web tokens created by Firebase auth. To do this, you need a secret file containing keys that authorize you to use the API. We find these keys by going to our project settings, clicking on service accounts, and clicking generate a new private key. It took me longer than I'd like to admit to find this button. After downloading this file, I copy it to my project root directory and rename it to private underscore keys dot json for simplicity's sake. Also, and this step is very important, if you are planning on sharing your code to GitHub or any Git hosting service, make sure you create a .git ignore file and add private underscore keys dot json or whatever you call the file to that git ignore. This makes it so that anytime you git add, this file gets ignored and prevents you from sharing these credentials to someone who might potentially abuse them. You'll see that I already have an entry in git ignore for the files directory. I recommend you do the same to prevent wasting bandwidth or uploading private files. Anyway, to instantiate our Firebase app instance, we use firebase.newapp and pass in our private key JSON file using option.withcredentials file. The first parameter can be context.background. In case you're not familiar with Go context, don't worry about it and just use context.background. For our use case, it works perfectly fine. The second option for firebase.newapp can be left nil. After this, let's just check for any error and panic if we got one. Now, we want to get access to the Firebase auth from our admin SDK. To do this, we call app.auth and pass in that context.background just like before. We also check for any error and panic if we got one. Heading back over to our post method, we are going to call a method called verify ID token. Since we'll be sending the access token as a form field, we can call context.request.form value to get that token.
We also pass in context.background here. Now the method returns the decoded token and an error. Let's check for that error and respond with an unauthorized status code if an error occurred. Make sure to use abort with status instead of abort with error if you don't want this error logged into your console. Now heading over to the line where we instantiate our file struct, let's add the user's ID, which can be accessed by authtoken.uid. We do not need to fill in the created at field because we are using the SQL default option to set it for us. Here, I try running the app and notice that I forgot to add if not exists to the create index statement. So make sure you have that as well. Testing the code out, I notice the value of created at is not being set. At first, I assumed this is because of the way the reference is being passed in, but actually the default option we use is not formatted correctly. I mistakenly use SQL colon instead of PG colon in the struct tag. After changing that and uncommenting our drop table line so that the table can be created with our new options, I run the script and try it out again. I also notice that we haven't added a JSON tag for the created at field, so let's go ahead and add that. Here I also decide to boot up pgadmin so we can get a better look at our tables and rows. I'll leave a link to download pgadmin in the description. pgadmin has a master password, so make sure you have that set. Now, when attempting to connect to the DB we have running, we just have to enter the password, which we set earlier in our docker run command. Now that we're connected, we can navigate to databases, postgres, schemas, tables, and go to our files table. On the files table, I right click, go to view slash edit data, and click all rows to view the rows. Here we can quickly see all the data in our table. At this moment, I remembered that Postgres has a better way of storing UUIDs instead of using a string. So I modified the lines you see on screen to use the UUID type instead of string. After changing all these lines, I noticed that my query stopped working. Do you remember in the last episode when I mentioned that you need to make a call to the where PK in the select statement? This is the point where I spent a good 20 to 30 minutes of debugging just to realize that I forgot to add that where PK call. Something you'll notice I did while debugging is I added these few lines of code. Adding these couple lines makes it so that each query to the database is logged in the console. This is very useful when you can't quite figure out what is wrong with your query. After that, I checked the query and realized that I needed that where PK call. I added it and there you have it. Our get endpoint is working now. I know things might have gotten a little jumbled, but at this point, your file struct should look like this, your get endpoint callback should look like this, and your post endpoint callback should look like this. Feel free to pause and make sure your code looks similar to mine. Alright, I think that's a good place to end off. In this episode, we added Firebase auth to our application and verified user tokens on the backend. We made a lot of progress, and with this, we'll be able to validate all future server requests. In our next episode, we'll be using a Firebase authentication to add some more endpoints to our backend. Anyway, thank you for watching, and until then, stay tuned and peace out.